Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out tonight to our final Politics in the Pub for this year. Um, looks like it's going to be a great event, great crowd, great panel, great MC. We're so happy that you've all decided to join us tonight. I'd like to start just by acknowledging the traditional, traditional custodians of the land on which we meet this evening and paying my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, this event is put on uh, by the New Farm Neighbourhood Centre, Communify Queensland. Um, we have hosted po politics in the pub four times a year, and at each event we attempt to address a contemporary issue important to the community of Brisbane. All of our panellists and MCs are volunteers and receive no reward except for hopefully a round of applause for their participation. We'd like to thank the patrons of New Farm who um, financially support these events. The Powerhouse also kindly supports these events. Um, and the Committee of, for Politics in the Pub uh, puts these events on, helps us decide on the topics, helps us um, seek out our wonderful panellists, so need to thank them as well. Uh, we have a new supporter for this Politics in the Pub with My Village News coming on board as a sponsor. My Village News um, uh, has only had one goal in mind since 2008, and they want to get behind the community. With the readership north to Newstead, west to Spring Hill, and south to Kangaroo Point, their heart is firmly in New Farm, where their office has been since day one. Politics in the Pub is an important event for the local community, and as My Village News cannot always write about the topics covered, they're proud to instead show their support with this sponsorship. So can we just give them a round of applause for jumping on board? So I'd just like to thank Rebecca Levingston, who has come on as our MC for this evening, and just give her a little introduction. So Rebecca was quite happily delivering daily traffic reports to ABC listeners before she was dragged kicking and screaming, apparently, into the producer's seat for Richard Feidler. Her life hasn't been the same since. She grew up in North Queensland and for many years was sure her future lay in ballroom dancing or on the netball court. She was wrong and somehow ended up studying hotel management and Japanese on the Gold Coast. A year of life in Japan and the UK taught her that people are infinitely interesting creatures and the seed of journalism was planted. It was only after a year of work in America that Rebecca decided her hex debt should be bigger and she returned to university to study journalism. Now she has a piece of paper that gives her permission to ask a lot of questions, and she's going to do that tonight. She's pretty happy about that. She's asked many a question on statewide evenings, ABC Brisbane Drive, and weekends. In 2018, you might have heard her waking you up from 6 a.m. on breakfast while sharing the microphone with her co-host, Craig Zonka. And when she's not at work, Rebecca switches roles and can be found answering the many questions asked by her two young boys. So can you just uh, thank Rebecca for joining us tonight? And um, she'll introduce the rest of the people up here to you. I can't believe um, that no one standing up there gave me any heckles during that introduction. Come on, ballroom dancing, netball. Thank you. We like that. Well, roll up, roll up, ladies and gentlemen, here at the circus in what? Politics and media in the era of disposable leaders, and I can only assume that as I work at the ABC and recently um, my managing director was sacked, the chairman of the board stepped down, and I'm not sure if you're aware, but the director of radio quit a week ago, so I'm assuming that that's what, why I've been invited to uh, <laughs> chair tonight. I was thinking about this and wondering um, if we could maybe blame that great modern political philosopher, Beyonce, for um, the leadership changes we've seen. Because remember her words when she sang, to the left, to the left, everything you own in a box to the left. Don't you ever get to thinking, said Beyonce, don't you ever get to thinking you're irreplaceable. And I always wondered, when we knife a prime minister, does he have a box of stuff, or she, have a box of stuff that she takes from the office? Like, you never saw that with um, Malcolm Turnbull. Maybe you saw it with Tony Abbott when he was moving at one stage. And I wondered as well whether Kevin and Julia shared the box as well as they made their way back and forth. Of course, we know that Scott Morrison will put his boat trophy in his box. Actually, sorry, Scott Morrison is still the Prime Minister. 
Yes. Is Peter Dutton here tonight? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, we have stability. We have stability in nicknames now with the current government. We've got ScoMo and Mick Mac, Michael McCormack, and it's not like there's anyone in the Nationals talking about a leadership change at all. Is Barnaby Joyce here tonight? <laughs> Maybe Bill Shorten is the only leader who is safe because um, of a piece of paper that I'm assuming was inscribed in Kevin Rudd's blood that ensures that he will stay as a leader. Who will be the Prime Minister come the next federal election? Well, that's a prediction I'm going to ask our panellists to make at the end of tonight. But if we are at a circus and I'm your ringmaster, I'm going to introduce these guys as the stars of the show. Wyatt Roy, at 20, the youngest person ever elected to the House of Representatives. Never get sick of being reminded of that fact. Australia's first minister for innovation. Innovation is what he needed when he lost his seat. He's now the general manager of Affinity. And Wyatt Roy once told me that he gets recognised far less often when he has a beard, which he grew fairly significantly after he left Parliament. You've almost got it tonight. So, of course, tonight that means, White Roy, you will be our bearded lady. Please welcome him. <laughs> Christine Jackman is here, a journalist. She covered the rise of Pauline Hanson and One Nation. She's worked everywhere from New York to Canberra and in between. She's the author of Inside Kevin 07. So tonight, Christine Jackman, that makes you the lion tamer. Welcome. <laughs> Neil Glenworth is here tonight, too, ladies and gentlemen, the founder of GWI and Democracy Intelligence. He uses information to make sense of political, social and economic activities. You're the juggler, if you're going to juggle that information. And Patrick Weller, ladies and gentlemen, Emeritus Professor in Politics at Griffith University. His latest book is The Prime Minister's Craft. I guess that means you try and explain how our leaders uh, bend, stretch and backflip. So you're our acrobat tonight, Patrick. Please welcome our panellists, ladies and gents. I'm going to start with a question to each of you that I want you to answer in 10 words or less. Why, Roy, why isn't Malcolm Turnbull the Prime Minister of Australia? <laughs> That didn't hurt at all, Beck, um, because he lost the support of the coalition party room. Uh, and I think uh, one of the, th this is not 10 words. Do you want the 10 word one or you want the slightly I'll give you one version? more sentence. One more sentence. In the Westminster system, the party room votes, not the electorate on the leader. And that is often lost. It has its flaws, but I also think it has its successes. And if we didn't have that system, we would never have seen Winston Churchill as prime minister either. So. Um, Definitely not a great system at the moment, the way we've been turning over leaders, but it is the system we have. <laughs> well done. Good heckle, good heckle. We'll have to like warm it up a little bit more. <laughs> That's the best they got. Patrick, why isn't Tony Abbott the Prime Minister? Don't forget to Because he's incompetent. <laughs> Christine Jackman, why isn't Kevin Rudd the Prime Minister? Did Kevin Rudd ever answer a question in less than 10 words? I just, I'd say programmatic specificity. Same, actually the same answer as Wyatt Roy. Lost okay. the support of his party room. So that's two boring and one mm. maybe honest. Uh, Neil, why isn't Julia Gillard the Prime Minister? Boring answer coming up, because politics is just about numbers. It's not about what's best. She's a woman, says someone in the audience. Ladies and gents, there will be a, a huge Q&A element to tonight. I'm going to hog the floor for a little while with these guys, but do store up your questions. Feel free to call out every now and again, though. It adds spice to life. <laughs> How do we account for the fact, though, that... No Australian Prime Minister has served out a full term in over a decade, Wyatt Roy. What's going on there? Well, I mean, it is, I think, a blight on Australian politics, and no doubt there's huge frustration in the Australian community about this. Um, in my mind, I think you can trace all of this back to uh, two things. One is the internal politics of the Labor Party around Kevin Rudd and the broader politics around climate change. 
Um, we were just chatting about this. You, you know, you can't relive history, but I actually think if Kevin Rudd had have called an election way back when on climate change, I think he would have won that election. Uh, I think he would have most likely survived all of that term, possibly at some point would have handed over to Julia Gillard. Um, and I think in that transition, she probably would have been a far more successful um, prime minister. So I think a lot of this you can trace back to that. I think trying to give it one answer for all the leadership changes is quite different. I mean, I was obviously in the parliament through um, changes on both sides of politics. And, uh, you know, personally, I thought it was a good thing that Malcolm became prime minister and, uh, at that time. But um, uh, I think, yeah, politics, you can go right back to that point. And uh, I think a lack of fortitude to take on that challenge. And we've suffered since. Patrick? Could it be a good sign that we've changed prime ministers so frequently? Let, let, let's take a slightly longer time horizon. You know, in 32 years, we had four prime ministers. In 10 years, we've had six. So it's not the system. It's the people involved and the choices that they're making. Um, and why do they keep trusting out prime ministers? Because they can. Because both parties recently had a system which allows you to have a quick vote on the floor. We are the, uh, just about the only Westminster system which still allows that to happen. Uh, the Labour Party's changed its rules now. If you want to get rid of a prime minister, you have to have 75% of the caucus voting. So it's going to be a lot more stable in that sense. But at the present moment, as soon as you don't like a prime minister, or they don't give you a job, or you're worried about your seat, you start counting the numbers. So as, as long as you have a system which says you can count the numbers and get rid of the prime ministers, people will count the numbers. If you go to Canada where you can't do it, no one counts the numbers, because there's no point. So our system makes it possible, and politicians being what they are, they use the system. Should uh, the Liberals and the Nationals do what Labor's done then? Uh, yes. I mean, I don't like going to the Canadian system where you can't get rid of a Prime Minister, but I think when you're balancing what's being accountable against being sort of democratic, letting everyone vote, they should have slight, slightly more difficult to get rid of a prime minister than it currently is. It's too easy at the moment. And you end up with a change of prime minister and nobody really knows why. Christine Jackman, you wrote about Kevin 07. He's since written very, very big books about Kevin. Have you read them? No. OK. <laughs> What, what do you make of Wyatt's theory that this kind of comes back to, to Kevin Rudd and that political history in this country could have been very different had his career turned out differently? Well, I think it's, it's, it's right and wrong. I mean, I think that's in the modern era where things started to change. And I would say at the end of... I, I wrote Inside Kevin 07 reasonably uh, on a very tight deadline because, you know, it was about the campaign that had won him that election and we didn't want him to get far into his first term before the book was out. Um, and I remember writing the epilogue in about April. He, the election had been in November and I wrote the epilogue to that book to get it to the publishers very quickly, um, five months later. And I remember saying, because the book was not so much about Kevin, much to his chagrin, and more about the people around him who had helped, you know, had put together this quite historic campaign, we forget, you know, the Labor Party had lost three elections against Howard um, before then, including with the Latham election, they went backwards. They lost, you know, it was one of the worst defeats they'd suffered, I think, since Whitlam. Um, and then somehow they managed to get together and create quite a modern campaign, if, if we remember it, um, a sense of hope, which was a big deal back then, and win an historic victory. And then at the end of this book, I said, well, but what happens if, if winning, even as much as it was an historic win, what happens if winning a campaign is the easy part and governing is the difficult part? And I think when you look around, um, that's only become more and more the problem. It's actually easier to mount a campaign because campaign's all about marketing, it's about numbers, it's about, you know, getting letters out and social media posts and all that sort of thing. Governing is infinitely more complex than any of that. And yet, and the other thing that's happened is this machine has evolved around campaigning. And I know because I've worked in it 
Um, I've worked, I've consulted and worked with people on both sides. Uh, as polling and research techniques have become more sophisticated, as campaign understandings, direct mail, email, as those things have become more sophisticated, there's developed this kind of magic around the whole thing. I mean, I don't know how many of you have, we, I can't tell actually, because I can't see you. But I have found, as I've become older, and I've had to be in situations where I've employed young people to do you know, your digital media, it's this whole area that is full of emperor's new clothes type stuff, you know, oh yeah, we can get you 10 hundred million likes overnight. Um, and you can't judge whether that's where they're getting, you can't judge the value of that stuff anymore because it's changing so quickly that you just have to and sometimes hope that the expert knows what they're doing. There's a lot of that that's evolved in campaign politics as well. Everybody's looking for a silver bullet, a magical thing that will get them across the line then they win and they get into government and there's no patience for doing what you're supposed to be doing, which is governing a very, very complex, advanced economy and community. So I hope that answers some of the questions. I think that, well, to go back to the original, original point, I think once Kevin won that um, election, remarkably quickly he had people, and I would sheet at home largely to Sussex Street, in Sydney, which is the home of New South Wales Labor and at the time the New South Wales right, who were, you know, the money men, the machine men, who were looking at these numbers all the time and had no patience for, you know, being told what to do. And Kevin was very good at telling people what to do. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, different principles and values than what I think most of the Australian people we're expecting. Very good at selfies though, but so is Malcolm Turnbull. I did read uh, Kevin Rudd's first book and in that he talks about the night that he won the election and he said he lay down after all of the kind of the craziness, he lay down on a pillow, turned to Therese and said, oh shit, so what do we do now? Which really struck me because it's very rare for a politician and very, I think extremely rare for Kevin Rudd to show any kind of... Um, wavering of, of confidence. Um, he said equally though, he wrote to Barack Obama when he was elected and this is exactly what he told me he wrote. Dear Barack, you poor bastard. Because of that level of expectation. But when it comes to selfies and personalities and that kind of, that, that win, Neil, do you think self-interest is trumping public service at the top end of politics? 100%. Style over substance. Uh, that's all it's become about. Um, uh, and to go to your broader question, um, I, I, I'll give it as I see it. Um, politicians and major political parties are crap at connecting uh, with their base. Uh, there are exceptions to that, and they tend to be fringe parties who connect directly to their base and can engage really well with them. Um, in the age of data and insights, it is uh, appalling that politics hasn't moved on and the parliamentary system hasn't moved on. And I'm not talking about changing the system, I'm talking about the fact that everyone here can comment directly to me, everyone here can engage on issues, yet we're constantly sold wholesale messages. I'm wondering why we feel so disconnected uh, than ever before. So. Um, I, I think it's the fact that, you know, it's, it, if I was looking at it as just a pure consultant, it's an industry that needs disrupting. You mentioned the political base there. Do you think modern political parties still have a base? That's a great point. Yes, they do, but it diminishes. You're always going to get rusted on um, voters in a particular party, but it diminishes. But it, there's some really valuable points here. You know, a campaign is one thing. Governing is another thing. Um, and again, I've worked on campaigns on both sides. Campaigns are easy. They're, you know, it is, you, you know they, they are the easy thing. It's governing that is the hard part. Um, and the complexity in an economy is, you know, and, and socialist is so complex, and it's just not thought through. Um, and then the machine takes over. So, um, you know, I, I think it's so, so important 
um, to actually blow politics up as it stands. Do you agree with that, Wyatt Roy? Is campaigning easy and governing hard? Uh, campaigning is character building, but I don't know whether um, uh, easy is the right word. Um, governing is hard. Governing is very hard in the modern environment, and this, I think, has what this is actually what has driven a huge amount of change in politics in the last few years. When I first got elected, um, within my electorate, there's a state Labor MP who uh, was the youngest member of the Labor side, and we became pretty good mates, got along well. Um, and said, come around to the office, let's have a chat, you know, first time after the election. And he said his predecessor used to get uh, letters in the mails from constituents, and that was pretty much his day-to-day -day job, was walk down to the post office, get the letters out, read the problems, you know, write a response, think about it, mail it back, and that was kind of it. You know, in my office would get easily 50 to 100 phone calls by 10, 30, 11 a.m., uh, you know, literally hundreds if not thousands of messages on social media every day. Um, I used to get 300 to 600 emails a day uh, on average. So that kind of shows you where politics has moved. And governing in that environment in a, you know, it's not even a 24-hour media cycle anymore. Journalists are filing every, you know, hour, every two hours now trying to beat each other. And to talk beyond the next day or the next news cycle uh, for a long-term vision for the country, which I think is actually what the public is crying out for. They are desperate for a long-term vision for the country. Now, you can agree with it or disagree with it, but I think they are crying out for that. Uh, and instead, uh, politicians have responded by all these kind of superficial things are, are about responding to that media. And the one consistent thing that I see across what has happened in politics in the last 10 years, there's lots of different individual issues but the lacking ingredient, I think, is conviction. It's actually conviction about a set of ideals and a realization that politics isn't about trying to be everything to everyone. It's actually about trying to achieve an agenda. It's actually trying to change the country. And the moment you try and reform something, if you're any good at it, you're going to upset some people. Any decent reform is going to upset some people somewhere. Um, you know, I used to say in politics, I could cure cancer and people would run out and say there was something wrong with how I did it. Uh, uh, it's true. And I think there has been that lack or that, not that real preparedness to take on that fight uh, and have that. And you know, whether that's the, CPR, you know, the CPRS under Rudd, uh, whether that's Gillard kind of, you remember the real Julia and the fake Julia and looking for an agenda whether that's um, Tony kind of having two or three things he wanted to do, but then not knowing what's next, whether that's Malcolm coming in with huge amounts of expectation and then not really utilising that to burn that political capital to do big reform. Uh, I think that's kind of the consistent theory. So governing is incredibly hard. The media makes it harder. The Senate in Australia makes it incredibly hard. I mean, like, we could talk the whole time about the Senate. Uh, but I do think if politicians had that conviction, took the fight up, you know, articulated that argument, uh, they are more likely to win and to govern well. And frankly, even if they lost, I'd rather lose doing that than lose doing nothing. I think you just re-entered politics, Wyatt. Huh. Uh, Patrick, who's been Australia's greatest conviction politician? Oh, that's a hard one. Greatest politicians much easier because you oh, can, go on. We'll start with you, that. You, you, you can talk about the two very effective prime ministers in the last thirty years, and they're Bob Hawke and John Howard, because they both tried to sort of, in part, do what Wyatt's talking about, which is to bring together all the different groups and manage both the system, the people, and the process. And that's really, really hard. And both of them conceded things at different times about doing things they might not have wanted to do. Um, but they acknowledged that winning is important because if you don't win, the other side wins. And however bad we are, they're worse, both sides. So winning's important, keeping support is important, maintaining some sort of care and policy is important. Um, you don't achieve it. But one prime minister said to me, well, if you get it 80% right, you're doing pretty well. Yeah. So you can't possibly win everything all the time and do everything you want all the time. And governing is hard. I've been fortunate to look at the diaries of a couple of prime ministers. 
you know, they work from six in the morning to 10 at night with people coming in wanting something. Everyone who sees them wants something. So you have to balance out these issues, knowing that you say no to somebody and you make an enemy. You know, and given the way that we can trust prime ministers, making enemies is not a good idea in politics at the moment either. So you, we've, got, we've had prime ministers who manage the system very well. And we've had prime ministers who haven't managed the system very well. Um, and the craft is managing to keep all those balls in the air at once. It's the juggler. It's managing to keep the politics, the policy, and the people all supporting you at the same time. I mean, that's hard. And good ones managed to do it. And we've had a couple of really good prime ministers for doing that. Now, you won't agree what, with what they did, and they did different things, and different people will approve of what they did. The process of governing, I think those two did it rather well. And it's got harder since, partly because everything is much faster. Partly because the media is always looking for something. I mean, one minister said to me, the trouble in this game is you aren't allowed uncertainty. Mm. You know, if you look at an item and it's 49.51, you choose the 51, and then you have to pretend it was the only answer. And somebody else says, well, why didn't you pick the 49? Well, it was on balance, but you're not allowed to say it's on balance, because the opposition says, well, you should have done the opposite one on those sorts of circumstances. So you're always playing with communities who agree and disagree. You've always got winners. You've always got losers. And as soon as you take something away from people, they scream. And the weight of noise often balances out the benefits, benefits of the people on the mass. So it's a really difficult game, governing. Yes, getting elected is the easy part. <laughs> um, governing afterwards is awfully hard. On uncertainty, Christine Jackman, is it the media, is it journalists demanding that politicians will rule out something or, you know, commit to X, Y, Z and then hold that piece of information and hold it up to uh, a politician should they dare change their mind or get another piece of information? Is the media the, the problem here? I've thought about this a lot, I think, because... I've worked on both sides. Um, I think that before, I mean, our temptation is to rush to blame just one thing. You know, it was all better when blah. Um, politics has changed, as I've said. Campaigning's changed. The way they govern's changed. Media has changed probably even more spectacularly. I should know. I worked in newspapers, and you know, since you know, less than ten years, we've had thousands now of, of, of journalists and, and, and associated people in that industry put out of work or, you know, who've left. Um, as a result, and it's not just because of, of the rise of digital, but as a result, uh, journalists increasingly being forced into quick and uh, catastrophic, you know, things that, things that spark panic, spark fear, spark negative emotions. Negative emotions play better, particularly in, in social media. If I can inspire anger or fear or anxiety in you, you are more likely to spend more time on my page. Uh, and you need to do it quickly. Um, a good example, actually, that goes to your point, Beck, is I realised in 2004, when Mark Latham lost that election, which was you know, con considered a disaster for Labor because they really did go backwards at a rate of knots. I was asked to do a sort of an analysis, a post-mortem of what went wrong behind the scenes. And with a, a, with a colleague of mine, Cameron Stewart, who's now the Washington correspondent uh, for The Australian. We used to work in New York together. And we thought about this because we thought nobody is, Latham was still leader, he was under threat. And we, normally what happens when a leader loses bad, that everybody goes to ground, except the people who want to point fingers, but they don't want to go on the record. So Cam and I came up with an idea that back then we thought, okay, well, we need about three weeks to turn this piece around. We will talk to everybody who is involved in the campaign, but not the, you know, at that point, for example, Kevin Rudd was on the back bench or a junior minister. So we, people like that we didn't talk to. We only talked to the people who were decision makers in 2004. And if somebody was going to tell us something off the record, we had to verify it with at least two other people who, because nobody was going to go on the record at that point. We were given the, the um, 
go ahead to do that. And we turned that piece around at one a Quill Award in, I think, in Victoria. It, it, it was and un, uh, destabilised Latham even more to the point that he made complaints about us uh, in, in Parliament. Fast forward to, I think, 2010, so not that far, six years. 2010 election, we were asked to do another post-mortem post when Gillard and Abbott were um, negotiating with the, with the crossbenchers. And we said, well, you know, again, nobody's going to talk because government hasn't even been won yet. Um, both sides are, are trying to win support. Uh, so, you know, we'll need same sort of time frame and we'll need to be able to do... No, three days, do what you can. So that was the first thing. We had to be... There was no tolerance for any sort of research anymore. The second thing that had happened during that period was that the preparedness for editors, news directors and so forth to take stuff off the record and just promote it. That's been one of the biggest changes in my experience as a, as a, as a journalist, um, is that now anybody who has, you know, a barrow to push or a score to settle will find their quote somewhere in the newspaper or on social media or wherever else. And I think that's a huge problem because we, and we've got a genera generation of journalists coming through who think that's fine who never stop and think, why is Mark Arbib, Carl Bittar, any of the number of people who've had scores to settle on the other side, you know, Tony Abbott, Peter Dutton, whoever, why are they telling me this? And why don't they want to put their name to it? How do I know whether it's true? Nowadays, that just isn't scrutinised in the same way. So that has upped the ante remarkably. It means that things can be pushed out quicker because there's no source or fact checking. And it means that a hell of a lot that's going on is just, you know, schoolyard bickering that's played out on the national stage. Yeah. Lack of time to fact check and that leads to a lack of trust in the media. And that's something that plays out in a whole range of industries. Now, Neil, you juggle political, social, economic information, people can find their own facts and declare things fake news whenever they want. It happens more and more, whether it's, you know, science or, or, or politics. How do we, if we want to, arrest that decline in trust of experts? Um. So let's just qualify some things first, I think, as well. Uh, one thing I certainly believe, it's never been harder to be a politician. Um, and, and, and that's me. So whatever we think of politicians of all persuasion, we have a democratic rule. And I am very thankful that people are willing to go and be politicians. So whatever, and, and it's a really important point because um, I, I think the notion that they're in it for themselves, I've never yet met a politician that's in it for the money, never. Um, uh, and they would be insane. Right now, um, the truth, uh, doesn't count for much. It absolutely doesn't count um, for much at all. People will find their own basis and they will believe what they want to believe. Um, and this is, it, it, it's almost a, a challenge for ourselves. If we really want change as a community, we can change, we can offer change. If we really want to understand the facts, we would. How many people actually read policies? They don't. The very fact that you are here as an audience is you are politically engaged, you are interested, that's quite rare these days. Um, in fact, very rare. The very fact that you've got views and well thought through and can articulate their arguments. And, and data can be you know, manipulated in a whole way uh, uh, and you know, it's not something we do. One of the things that I um, did, I was asked pre, and I'll declare this, pre all their scandal, I was asked to go to London by Cambridge Analytics. And I went to London, um, and they were interested in the Australian market, they were interested in uh, coming here. Um, and I spent a week with them, and uh, at the end of that week, I made an ethical decision, which was about a year prior, that it wasn't for me, um, in terms of uh, what they were doing. But it, elections now, um, and engagement, isn't about good policy, good governance. Um, you know, the, the Australian economy is doing really well at the moment. You wouldn't know that 
Um, you, you'd actually think there's a whole range of other issues going on. And so you'll come to a question later on, which you alluded to, and I, I want to preface it, which is who will win the next election? Whoever can run the best campaign. Who deserves to be in government? Now, that's another question um, as well. And we've never had that before. Because in the era of Hawke, which I wasn't in Australia for, and the era of Howard, it was who is the best person to run the country? Now it'll be who will run the best campaign and we'll just deal with it once we get there. So you, uh, in terms of what actually goes on in terms of fake news, um, there's a massive amount of fake news. Um, and it, the way Facebook's designed is to share what you share and what you look at with the people that like similar interests to you, which is the whole idea of Facebook. Um, you know, Twitter, Instagram, all of those things, and I, I think they're great tools, by the way. But um, we're all and can all be manipulated. My contention going back to politics, there are ways to cut through this. And there are ways to have transparent and accountable governments. Um, I declare a slight bit of conflict of interest because I'm involved with the, the company in the United States. In the United States, there is a piece of software called OpenGov. It was designed for government. It dealt with the California cash crisis. It was dealing when the city of Detroit went broke. And it was about open and transparent governments. Corrupt people are being caught out. Politicians that are in it for themselves are being caught out. 2,000 public institutions growing by about five a week. We have to change the way we engage and get our news. What you should rightly ask for is you want to see the dashboard, not, uh, the, a dashboard of the budget in nice colours that you can understand. What you don't want to see is facts and figures and some boring monologue of highlight points to score political points. How does it impact you? And you need to get to the source. And Australian politics is terrible at that, absolutely diabolical at it. <laughs> yeah, well, what was the thing? Open Gov. It, it, open I know, gov. say, I declare my it, it, Open Gov. Open Gov, uh, okay, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, finding out um, someone who is clearly manipulating data or, um, you know, championing fake facts is one thing. What becomes more difficult, I think, is um, spin if you want to call it that, where, um, let's take for example, I had a conversation with the, the Treasurer this week, the Comsec State of the States report is out. Uh, Queensland's rated sixth, the bottom three, you know, just above the Northern Territory and Western Australia. The Treasurer says, it's a flawed proposition, it's a flawed w criteria that Comsec has to rate the State of Queensland. We prefer Deloitte. Now, she's not, Championing. He's just not saying that's fake news, but it becomes very muddy for the person driving on the way to the work to work that morning to go, well, is Queensland in, in good health or or not? Because is that flawed methodology or is it like that's the difficulty, isn't it? Not not finding the person who's flat out lying or manipulating facts to that extent. Uh, it, um Yes, it is, and this is, you know, and I get so angry about this, it is almost, um, and I've spoken direct to the Treasurer about this, is that a, a politician has a duty not to pick and choose facts that suit them. We, we should deal with the facts, and uh, what the Treasurer should be doing is actually saying, yes, unemployment is high, yes, we have, and this is how we're going to deal with it. Not cherry picking, because if the Comsec said we were number one, I'm sure they'd be backing it. And Part of the problem is we follow the bouncing ball constantly with an agenda that suits the policy of the day. Queensland has some serious financial issues. It really does. Let's deal with the facts and let's get it out there. And we'd be delighted by any government that will address them. And I, I agree with the point about long-term vision. But the data we can pick and choose, and people do, it's, um, and, and rightly so, it's an incredibly dangerous place when we don't deal with base facts? To a degree, I think, when you, when you um, raise that sort of image of people sitting in their cars listening to Jackie Trout or whoever else on the, um, on the radio. On ABC Radio Brisbane. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's probably become a moot point because people don't think what's the facts. They will be thinking, 
yeah, 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 she's a politician, I don't believe her anyway. Of course she would say that. And that's a real problem. And it goes to what, um, what Wyatt said at the very beginning, which is the people who stand for something will, will win respect. And, and I'm not just saying that because it's a nice idea. I've seen it in focus groups. I've seen it in research. Even if they don't like you, they will respect you. And that was what held up Howard for an awfully long time, um, was that even people who didn't like him would say, that guy hasn't, doesn't change. We, I know what he stands for. To a degree, until his latest personal debacle, there was a degree of that with Barnaby Joyce. You'd see it. People would go, he just says what he thinks. At least I know what he thinks. He's not giving me the dot points that these days get texted out to everybody at the beginning of the day from head office, the PM's office. These are the things you speak to. So that when you hear politicians during the day, they will hit the same lines. People are have woken up to a lot of that anyway, but they have an enormously good ear for working out when you are actually authentic. Um, Graham Richardson said years ago, the mob will work you out, and they do. They're much smarter than what your average spiv in Canberra thinks. Um, and I think that, the, you know, to answer that question, you know, what our tre the, the Queensland Treasurer should have done is said exactly that. I'm not happy with this, and here, is what we are going to do to address it. So if the mob, you're the mob by the way guys, uh, can figure that out, why can't politicians figure that out, Patrick? Oh, on the whole, they probably can. I mean, what was it they commented? If you can fake sincerity, you've got it made. So that the, the, the Barnaby Joyce, you know, I'm a decent sort of thing, you know, well, until it, the, the, it hits the road. But can I warn against nostalgia? about arguing that suddenly things are worse than they were. I mean, there must be a few people here as old as I am who can remember Billy McMahon. <laughs> and I tell you, nothing we've had now comes close to Billy McMahon. Tell us something horrendous that Billy McMahon well, did just to make us feel it's, better. It's, it's, it's Paul Haslack, who was one of Billy McMahon's colleagues, who said he was a devious, lying, disreputable, unbelievable, little, I'm not sure what the next word was. <laughs> bleep. But um, bleep, yeah. Uh, this was in a book he wrote. I mean, this wasn't a throwaway comment. This was a considered comment of somebody who worked with him for some time and even was governor general while he was prime minister. <laughs> um, so we can go back to some people. I mean, Billy McMahon lied the whole time. Um, I mean, he then complained none of his ministers could tell the truth. Um, I mean, he was a horrible little man who became <laughs> prime minister. Um, so that the, the things we are complaining about now are not actually completely new. They may be more sophisticated in the way that they lie. Um, but he was, of course, trying to tell a story about why he somehow had done a decent job in politics, which he hadn't. Um, so firstly, there's that side of the story. And we could go back, the techniques have changed because the technology has changed. The arguments used to be the first modern political campaign was Gough Whitlam, this time. But you could actually go back a lot earlier than that when people started running national campaigns. They just had different vehicles for doing it. So now we get there much more rapidly, but the politicians, I think, are no better and no worse than they've ever been. And we can point at some of the campaigns that were run in this country on this conscription crisis, on the anti-communist referendum, the infights in the Labour Party um, during the split in the 1950s, the horrendous stuff that was being said about people in those days, um, which make modern stuff look comparatively tame. So let's not pretend that suddenly what's happening now has never been precedented. The nature of Australian politics is it has always been brutal. It has always been up front. It's always been one in which there are sort of the losers lose badly in these circumstances. And I can go back 150 years to prove that point. So that what we've got now is sophisticated, modern techniques, we've got social media, we've got other methods of doing what they've been doing for a very long time. Wow. Can I don't I, know if that makes I, us feel better or worse. Can I jump in there and recommend, I came across a very good article on exactly this a point called 
The Good Old Days, um, written by one Professor P. Weller in the Griffith <laughs> Review. And it is very, very, I, honestly, if you have read one article tonight when you go home, Google that and read it That's because cool. it's, a, it's a brilliant piece of writing on exactly that. And I would, I would add that the other thing that we tend to forget when we're being nostalgic is that um, Australia was largely a homogenous white uh, country up until, you know, basically less than my lifetime. You know, um, the 70s, I think Richard Glover, the ABC journalist, has a piece, a book out at the moment called, I'm not spruiking yeah. for the ABC. Oh no, it's Avocado. Land Before Avocado. Land, avoca or country Land before, before Avocado, yeah. And I heard him on Richard Feidler actually during the week talking mm. about exactly this, the monoculture that was Australia in the 70s mm. made it enormous, much more easy to, to govern because you were talking about you know, a macho white culture where, you know, for the Labor Party, you know, I think probably 50, you know, the union um, membership was up over 50% of the workforce generally. Would that be right? Yeah. 400,000. Yeah. 400,000 members of the Labor Party. Yeah. So... Uh, about the same number as Adelaide Football Club. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and, you know, our industry, we still were largely on the sheep's back and we were mining and that was about it. We didn't have, you know, much, you know, we knew where we stood in the world and, you know, the Great Britain was still where we took our cues from. Some former prime ministers still do. Um, <laughs> And um, yeah, so in that regard, it was much easier to craft a message and know that you were going to hit 70% of your audience because they were all the same. But, but isn't that the point? And, and I've got to take, uh, Patrick makes some great points, but you know, that was in the past. It has become more hard and complex. And I'm sorry, politicians right now need to work harder to connect. If I in business, I own three different businesses, employ over 100 people. If I ran my business in the same way I did five years ago, I would be out of business. Um, and it, it, we can't accept that. And, and I realize adversity over past generations in Australia has been incredibly tough. But to accept it and say that it isn't bad. The Edelman Index of Trust has Australia um, of the least trusting of any Western democracy and its politicians right now. Some of the lowest levels of trust. Interestingly, not-for-profits are there, mm. businesses there, and guess what, banks are there as well. Um, but that's the very point. I, I, I'm, I don't believe the system needs to change, but um, I want to see a leader that is elected, and I want to see people engaged in data. And it goes to the point about best prime ministers, uh, okay, and it is an applicable. Julia Gillard, when she pushed for NDIS, and the genuine conviction to get through NDIS, I mean, that was groundbreaking. She doesn't get the credit for that. The only person that gave her the credit is Jeff Kennett, who's now appointed her as chair of Beyond Blue, because even he could see that. And, uh, you know, Bob Hawke, yes, did an amazing job from my read, but John Howard was able to then leverage what he did, and then Kevin Rudd could leverage what John Howard did. It's not just such a siloed issue. Politics is evolving, and we should expect more. We should expect better communication. And we've just seen Julia Gillard acknowledged for her contribution in driving the apology to victims of yeah. institutionalised child sex abuse. And yet, probably if you asked a bunch of um, regular Australians about Julia Gillard to quote a famous line from her or what she contributed or what government was like... I reckon one of the first things that would be in there would be that line, there will be no carbon tax under the government that I lead, because that was repeatedly trotted out. My question is, at what point does the individual consumer, voter, engaged person in a room at the powerhouse on a Tuesday night have to take responsibility for logging political contributions, promises, facts, and not remaining in an echo chamber of, of siloed views. Is it, up, is it partly up to the individual as much as the politician, or am I asking too much of people with busy lives? Can I start this first? So one of my uh, pet hates is when the current premier refers to my government. It absolutely drives me insane, because it, it is the notion 
that the government in terms of some ownership, it's not. The, the, the Queensland government is our government and elected on our behalf. And I, I, I really think it is a level of uh, naivety in terms of politicians to not hold themselves to higher standards and accountability. Um, it is incumbent on the individual. The vote is precious. Um, I, I have had the fortunate place to work in many countries where the vote isn't a right. And uh, the perspective of having the right of democracy is something we should never squander. So yes, we do have responsibility. Why, Roy, did it annoy you as a, an MP when people would pick and choose facts and figures and what they said a particular government or politician promised yeah, or mean, was entitled to? Yeah, of course. Lots in politics annoys you. And I think um, you're right. This picking and the choosing of facts and then the debate that you spin around them really, I think, does one thing. It massively dumbs down the debate. And if we think about Australian politics and we think about global politics at the moment, it's true. The debate has been massively, massively dumbed down. And if you remember the, the leadership change from Tony to Malcolm, this really was the great hope, was that we were going to be able to break out of this. You know, no more slogans, that we were going to explain the challenges and opportunities facing the country in a period of extreme change, um, that we were going to do something very novel, and you know, I'd love to see what people think about this idea, but we were going to say, here's the policy challenge, here are all the potential policy solutions, left, right, in the middle, whatever. Uh, agree with them, disagree with them. We were then going to say, what can we agree on as a nation in the middle? And then let's do that and at least make some reform and then fight for a bigger change. And of course, literally within weeks, that all fell apart. Um, uh, you know, people remember the, the debate around significant tax reform, which you know, I obviously think the country needs. Um, so that used to absolutely drive me insane. Uh, and I think it takes a very, very brave politician uh, to not dumb down that debate. And it's not like doing it once or twice, it's doing it every second, every moment of every day, forever, in that grind to actually drive that through. Um, but I do have a couple of great hopes on this. Um, if, you, if you look around the world, this is true. There's this huge anti-authoritarian, stuff the system, stuff the politicians, you know, um, system that's happening at the moment. And I think a big part of that is driven by, by this. I mean, the, the Economist said a little while ago, if you think about uh, the printing press changed the way that people communicate. You know, you, you saw huge changes in society and uh, in the economy and whatever. Well, now we've put a supercomputer in the hands of every human being on the planet and connected them all and allowed them to talk to each other. That will have massive impacts on society, economy, and politics. And we're seeing that play out. Look at Trump's America, look at Brexit, look at Italy, look at Greece, look at Spain, look at, you know, all across the world this is playing out. The one politician who I, I think is actually achieving this, and it's hard to find them, uh, is Emmanuel Macron in France. If you think about this guy, I mean, this is somebody who was, you know, a, a failed finance minister in a terrible socialist party government who said, stuff this, I'm getting out, this is actually what I believe. And he, he has incredible conviction on what he believes, radically changing the labor force in France, which is like, you know, World War Three, way harder than uh, climate politics in Australia. Uh, really doing big, significant economic reform. This is who I am, this is what I stand for, and running at it, and you see him have that fight every day. Now, very different political system, and there's no way he would have been elected here with our political system, but at least in France, five years in power, both houses of parliament, reform that's never been seen. You can actually do it in this system, um, but you know, it takes a very special person, I think, to lead a government like that. Wow. Ladies and gents, we're going to uh, bring some microphones around to you. Kirsten and Marina, I think, have them. So if you've got a question, put your hand up. Be brave, be bold. Um, I'll just put one last question to you, Patrick, before we get to the punters. Um, the current government, with the Wentworth result, um, a minority government, lots more conversations with the, the crossbench, why it mentioned before, you know, about you know, dealing with the Senate and, and what's going to play out there. H how do you think this current government will, will play out until, well, May 2019 or whenever the next well, election it'll, is? It'll play out to May 2019 because there's no one that has really got on the crossbenches the wish to shorten it. So uh, 
and you never put all the crossbenchers together in order to have a vote of no confidence in the government and bring it down. So the, I think in that sense, the government is quite safe. I don't think it's going to make very much difference to the way it operates, for better or worse, um, over the next six months. Does Wentworth foreshadow something? Not as much as I think people have made out. I mean, this was a free vote to have a kick at the government because you knew, in fact, it's not going to lose power because of it. It's a by-election. Um, it allows you to express an opinion. It's a pretty educated uh, electorate on the grounds that on things like climate change and a whole range of other things, they probably got quite strong opinions. Will Phelps hold the seat after the next election? Possibly because she's an independent. Had she been Labour, the answer would have been no way. It would have been rather like Ryan here at one stage in the Howard government. They win the by-election but lose the general election. So she might win. She might win by coming second or third and getting up on the votes on the way round. Will it make much decision? Is the foreshadowing an election result, general election result? No. I don't think it will at all. Um, I think we've still got eight months to fight it out between them. And uh, if Morrison can manage to do rather better than he's done so far, um, you know, they're still within in shooting range. I mean, John Howard was 2% behind going into election. He thought he was home and dry, you know, because he thought, you know, he was good enough campaigning to get up, and it worked every time until up, he came up against Kevin Rudd. Although he did have Mark Latham, to, so that was really probably an unfair <laughs> comparison. Um, so Wentworth is interesting, but not decisive in any form. All right, ladies and gents, over to you. We open, we opened this evening with an acknowledgement of country. Is it time that we went a little bit further than respecting the elders and acknowledging the emerging leaders and actually say uh, that the injustices that flow from the stolen land, the stolen wages, the stolen children needs to be addressed? White Roy, I'm going to throw that to you. <laughs> because Thanks, <Beck. laughs> you're the only one who's been in government and successive governments have struggled to address whether it's health, education, um, job outcomes for Indigenous people. Why, why are we still in a situation where we have goals that we fail to meet? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of moving parts in this conversation. So, um, you know, I, I, I would carefully work my way through them. Um, to your first point about it's uh, acknowledging the injustices before, and um, the question is how do we best do that? Uh, and I'm sure you have views on that, and I'd love to hear uh, what those views are, and you know, that's the conversation the country has to have. For me, when I look more broadly at, at the uh, inequality between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, this is a massive, massive blight on our nation. Uh, if you look at all of those statistics, and you know, using facts is a great example here of where we should. Uh, life expectancy, health outcomes, uh, attendance at school, there is a huge disparity between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, and that's across the board. It's not just in uh, remote and regional communities, it's in the cities as well. My, my old electorate, I think, had the third highest urban Indigenous population in the country, and we fight these issues every single day. Um, you know, horrifically, if you look at the rates um, of child sexual abuse in regional Australia, the fact that we kind of look the other way on that. Um, and we had a moment, you know, people would disagree with the response, but a moment when we had the, the Little Children of Sacred report, which, you know, ultimately led to the Northern Territory intervention. But that report, those figures aren't really that much better today when you look at everything that's happened. So as a country, um, this is something that despite what I actually think is genuine goodwill. I don't think you could say there's not a lot of goodwill on this issue. I mean, um, you know, the way that we approach these issues have changed a lot in, in recent years. Um, obviously, the apology has changed the focus on this, and we have the closing of the gap. I don't know if everyone knows about the closing of the gap, but every year there's a statement in Parliament, and the idea is that the government would be held accountable to those figures. So, so the idea of the closing the gap is the government uh, should be held accountable to these figures every year in the Parliament. And basically every year that we've had this, the figures have either stayed the same or gone backwards. So clearly there is fundamental change that has to happen across all of government. Uh, and you know, I think 
you know, we can disagree with Tony on a bunch of different things, but I think he did a couple of really good things here. He bought it all in uh, Prime Minister and Cabinet. So when you're trying to get kids to school, you're not just dealing with the education system, but the welfare system, and you can actually drive that through government. And that's a very, very hard thing to do way harder in this circumstance. So I think that's a good change. I actually really like the fact that he took the government to a regional or remote Indigenous community for a week a year. Um, you know, when you're dealing with the Canberra bubble and people can talk about that and you're dealing with public servants who have spent their entire life living in Canberra, actually taking them out into these communities is a really good thing. And it was one of these things as a member of parliament that was very confronting, seeing the machinery of government that sat behind the politicians and how detached from mainstream Australia that was, because they don't do what politicians do. You know, they're not out in nursing homes every week and schools and doing town halls and forums. They're sitting in well-paid jobs in Canberra protected. So I think trying to change that approach, um, very, very hard, but there are a few good things that we can do. And this is the one issue where there is no silver bullet whatsoever. Okay. And of course, Tony Abbott is now the special envoy for Indigenous Australia. I'm not sure, ma'am, whether that gives you uh, more hope or not. <laughs> to another question, ladies and gents. Yep. Thank you. And thank, I hope the, the woman that, that collapsed is, is, yes, she's getting to her feet now. Yep. She's fine. Okay. Um, I'd like us, we've dealt very briefly with the leaders that were cut off in their prime. I'd like to go back to someone um, who still wields enormous influence and his protégés still infect Australian government. And as far as I can recall, and my memory is far from perfect, he is the only politician, and certainly the only Prime Minister, to have been voted out in his own electorates. And I think that John Howard has a great deal of economic and social malaise to account for. And somehow or other, we always seem to elide this particular issue. So I'd like the, 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 uh, the experts at the front, please, to see, to, to please try and at least touch upon why this person, who was diselected by his own electorate, still is allowed around to influence people so much. Patrick. Uh, he, he was the second prime minister to be tossed out by his own electorate. You know, 1929 was the first Stanley Bruce. Um, because for 10 or 11 years, he apparently gave Australia a stable government. Now, there are a number of grenades which he left in the economy, which have been exploding since, in terms of the tax relief that he cut and in terms of the superannuation tax free, which I benefit from some. Um, <laughs> You're going to give it back? No, 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 no. <laughs> um, so that there were a number of grenades he left, and one could argue he was lucky in that the mining boom existed and the money was pouring in at the time that he was prime minister. But I don't think you actually win by luck alone. I think that he was actually a prime minister who sorted his message out. Now, arguing he was a good prime minister is not a comment for either him or her that I agree or disagree. I'm looking at in a technical sense about how well did he run a government. And I think anyone that managed to win four elections in a row and anyone that managed to keep a reasonably coherent government has got certain abilities, uh, which we should recognize whether or not we actually appreciate everything that he did. I think there's some problems he left. Why did he lose? Because the time ran out, the votes rang out, uh, the swing was against him. Uh, I think in that sense, he was probably quite relieved that he wasn't in parliament as next prime minister. Christine, do you want to weigh in on that? Um, I would add to that, I mean, if voter fatigue, but um, he became overconfident. I think he would even admit that himself now with, yeah. um, uh, whatever the what prompted the Your Rights at Work campaign, uh, the industrial law changes that he attempted that um, just were massive overreach when he had the Senate and prompted um, Kevin hates hearing this, but that the 2007 election was won by middle of that year by the ACTU led by Greg Combe, 
because what they did to... I mean, Howard made the mistake of poking the bear and the ACTU ran one of the most effective campaigns on the ground, in the grass, you know, grassroots, about, you know, against those changes. Um, I'm not going to endorse John Howard. There's a hell of a lot that I... Um, disagreed with him about and, you know, to this day his refusal to engage with um, issues in confronting Indigenous Australia will be one of the great stains, I, I think, on his legacy. However, I would also say that, uh, like Patrick, I suppose, from a technical perspective, you know, there were, as I said earlier, there were things that we knew that he stood for and the electorate liked that. They liked, he was solid. He was benefited from the fact that he had an enormous amount of money sloshing around from about, you know, the 2000s, early 2000s, to the point where I'd heard, you know, almost firsthand of budgets where it was sort of like, oh, we've got, you know, X hundred million left over. Let's find something to do with it. What will we do with it? Let's make up a program. It was, you know, it was a very good time to be a treasurer or a prime minister. Um, when you have that problem. Uh, let's remember one thing about John Howard, though, when it, terms, it, it comes to conviction, and I don't think you can underplay this. I remember very clearly the day he stood up um, in front of a bunch of angry farmers after Port Arthur, and he was wearing a, a bulletproof vest. Um, I remember that because he was arguing for gun control, one of the probably great achievements um, socially that we've achieved. Um, I received death threats, serious enough to have um, police come to the newsroom for writing about why we should have gun control. So I can only imagine how serious it was for him at that time. Um, he would have, he had people that day say, police say, do not go and address this crowd, we can't assure you, you will survive. He fought for that one and it changed um, Australia for the better. And that was a great example of a conviction politician putting not just his belief, but his life, I guess, on the line. So I think with every legacy, I guess what I'm saying is there are, there are strengths and weaknesses. Why did he get voted out and been along? The swing was on. The ACTU, as I said, had, had um, manifested a great campaign. Kevin had can campaigned as Howard Light. Yeah. You know, remember, I'm an economic conservative. He was never going to be the anti-Howard. Um, he was going to be just a little less like Howard. Mm. And, you know, in the end, that worked. And he's still incredibly popular amongst a lot of people. In fact, I was at... Um, it, was a, it was a couple of years ago uh, when his book came out. But here, out on the deck with John Howard, I've never seen people flock to a politician like that. I, I think if he, like, ran today, it was yeah. John Howard versus Bill Shorten. <laughs> like, Actually, honestly, yeah. I wouldn't... <laughs> I wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> I would. I would honestly Rebecca, never he, underestimate that. And and I and I just would make one point. You know, I hate to disappoint you. I think you and I are going to have very different views on uh, John Howard. And there's nothing I can say in the next 30 seconds that will convince you to change your view of of uh, John Howard. Um, but I would go back to exactly this point about who are the really great politicians. It's conviction, and I think it's politicians who are prepared to take on their own side. And if you look at this, Bob Hawke did the same thing. Bob Hawke took on his own side around economic reform. Howard took on his own side around uh, guns. And I think that was the making of their prime ministerships. Uh, and that will last. To your point about Howard having all this influence, I don't exactly know what you think John Howard's influence on the modern Liberal Party is today. I don't think he's calling up people, telling them what to do. He's, he's an elder statesman. Um, him and Bob Hawke are great friends now. I think it's wise counsel that people seek out, but I don't think... Howard, some sort of major player in the Liberal Party stuff happening today that's just wrong. Okay, let's go to another question, and uh, hopefully it's one for Neil. Uh, maybe down on the... We've got to swap sides. Come on. Oh, there's an order. I was told we had to swap sides, left, right. Okay. You know. Like in politics. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've, we've talked about the different Prime Ministers who got thrown out in fairly quick succession. But I do think there's a difference in the mechanisms by which they got thrown out. Mm. And for at least the last, I've lost tra three maybe, may maybe four, Tony Abbott was a key cause of the instability. Now, how do we protect our country 
from politicians who set out to be nothing but a wrecker, which is what he did. He used it incredibly effectively to wreck anybody's hopes of governing. And that is so dangerous and so destructive. How do we protect our country from it? Did, go, Christine. Well, I think we alluded earlier to the fact that uh, Kevin Rudd made it harder on his side to change leaders, which takes away a lot of the um, impetus for wrecking. There's no point wrecking them if you can't then cha change them. Uh, I think, I actually think that the electorate, because the, ele the electorate, again, works you out. I think the electorate is waking up to this. There is a growing resentment, I think, towards that sort of behaviour. People aren't stupid. They, they, they're becoming less tolerant about people. And I think the latest leadership change really showed that with, um, you know, with um, the, uh, the Dutton Conservatives bringing it on against, um, against Malcolm Turnbull. There was a sense that this is pointless at this point. Um, so I think, and, and the fact that um, the member for Warringah has faced a pre-selection challenge, that's, did it get, get to, yeah. Not quite. Very close to it. Um, I think. It was an empty chair. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, I think we may see, I mean, he'll, he'll have a, a swing against him, but I, I think we will see uh, some punishment meted out. Uh, certainly, um, I think Mr. Dutton's on a very tight margin as well. So, yeah, we'll see. But I, I, my, that's my instinct, is that people are le less and less tolerant towards that sort of game playing. I, th I think that there is a massive lesson for my side of politics in the events of the last, you know, few months. Um, you're saying, how do we stop that negative influence? And you do it by not allowing that influence to have a disproportional impact on the parliamentary members of the Liberal Party so that they don't do these sorts of things. If you look at, in my mind, uh, and colleagues, former colleagues of mine like um, Craig Laundie have also said this, uh, there is a very small group of people who talk to an echo chamber that has a huge impact on some of my colleagues. I can just name them. Alan Jones, Ray Hadley, Peter Credlin, Sky News After Dark, all of those wonderful people. I don't think there's any ABC commentators on their back. Um, but that's it. I mean, like, have I missed one of them? I think that's it, right? Four, five, six, Andrew Bolt, thank you. Five or six people. Those five or six people who, you know, you look at Alan Jones' ratings in Sydney, they're just... They're good ratings for radio stations, but he's talking to nobody. He's talking to a handful of angry people. And that has created a massive echo chamber um, that feeds into members of parliament sitting in their office, watching Sky News, watching um, uh, these commentators. And these commentators have no longer been, become commentators. They're activists. They're actively involved in the political process. Um, you know, Peter Credlin chose to do something very different after she got out of parliament. But I mean, she's not an independent commentator who's not talking to people. She's actively moving uh, these things inside the parliament. So the only way from my own side of politics that you stop this is for members of the Parliamentary Liberal Party to wake up and say, you know, these five or six people just aren't as important as they like to think they are. If I was, they aren't if I was advising, I would print out the ratings for Sky After yeah. Dark. It's, it's, it's 30,000. It's 30. I mean, it's, a, a peak would be 40. What, 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 is, what is ABC... What, what's the drive program rate? Like, I'm sure it's great. What is it in Breakfast. the morning? Breakfast. <laughs> Breakfast. What is it? Oh, well, it's over about 120,000. So one, one capital city, a small one in Australia... A, you know, a good, great radio station talking to several times more mm. than Sky After Dark mm. in their most popular show. Mm. Until members of parliament can realise that and say, hey, this just isn't mm. so bad. And also the impact that that has on the branches and the grassroots of the party. I think um, this is a really hard thing to break out of. But we, but we also need to be careful it, that it's democracy. And uh, there are people in that but, person's but, but seat. No, 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 but yeah, but we, let, now we let need to yell, allow it. Let them yell, let them let talk, them let them and do this that. Is about but, don't change, but don't change the way you govern. But this, is about, lack of, this is about lack of leadership. Yeah. If Scott Morrison's message was so strong, Tony Abbott wouldn't come into the equation. It's about lack of leadership and conviction. And I, I agree. 
that, you know, that you will work it out. We will know and we will work these people out. Um, the, the most sickening thing in, in politics is this. It's my turn. It's my turn now. It's my turn. I want to be leader now. And that is what is absolutely repulsive about the nature. Um, and, and Tony Abbott, for whatever good he may or may have not done, um, I think we should trust in people to work that out because people are working that out. Um, what his electorate think, that's up to them. Um, but we're allowing it to distract us. Um, there is no way we should allow that. It's a lack of leadership, plain and simple. Uh, we need some more conviction and more leadership. And, you know, bringing Tony in the tent, great. But, um, you know, deal with the consequences. How quickly did if, if, if we always work it out, why do we get Clive Palmer? <laughs> Well, it's a circus, Patrick. Well, that's my point. <laughs> that Clive Palmer played it just about right. He started three months before the election. He gets elected, and then we all realize he's a buffoon. <laughs> um, and this has been quite common. I mean, Queensland, 25% voted for Pauline Hanson in 1997. Yes, after a period of time, but if they, the timing is right, and it's an insurgency just before an election, I, we don't always work it out that fast. <laughs> so that occasionally we ought to be really careful about assuming that we will get it right. And but, that but we can't Patrick... follow the examples of the United States, of Britain, these people who've ended up with problems that they create. Well, I think Trump's a problem, but um, a large chunk of the Americans don't. But isn't so, this, Patrick, it's, so uh, obviously I'm from the UK, it's about compulsory voting. That's why. It's about, I'm not going to spoil my vote, it's about compulsory voting. So unlike the UK and US, um, uh, parties and those trying to get elected don't have to appeal to fringe groups to get them to turn out. As you hear about, I'll get the Latinos to turn out in America. It, this is about compulsory voting. And most people are quite disengaged, as we've already talked about it. Ah, oh, Clive Palmer, that looks like a bit of fun. That's about the level of it. And I think compulsory voting, which, uh, you know, the rights and wrongs, probably not to go into that, but compulsory voting does encourage behaviour. Um, and certainly my observation of it is fringe parties do far better in Australia because voting is compulsory. And so if you want to spoil your vote, yes, you can draw phallic symbols on your vote card, or you can have a bit of fun and vote for a candidate. The monster raving lunar party, loony party in the UK has always received quite a massive vote. Screaming Lord Such, the head of the monster raving Labour Party, I'm from the UK, um, <laughs> used to get a couple of hundred votes in a lot of electorates. He didn't get any more, he didn't expect it, and everyone knew he was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad we sorted that out. <laughs> so. uh, and just finally on Sky News, how hard did they uh, campaign to get you on as a commentator after you lost your seat? <laughs> uh, Briefly. Well, I mean, the one thing I didn't want to do after politics was become a commentator. So they I'll asked. leave it at that. I'll, I, will, I will just leave it at I. I made a very conscious decision after Parliament to get as far away from politics as possible, to go as deep as possible into the private sector, uh, and um, not join many, many of my former colleagues commentating on things, you know. And mostly those professions are built out of beating up on former colleagues. Mm. Like, let, let's be honest about it. If you're a commentator on Sky News, you're probably there because you're going to say something bad about people you used to work with. And I don't know how that's a fulfilling experience for a human being. I've got to say, I'm pretty happy where I am. Is Bill Shorten authentic? Did everyone hear that? The All question right. is: Bill Shorten well, well, authentic? Why don't we, like vote. Yeah. Get people to... That's a great idea, ladies and gentlemen. Put your hand in the air if you think Bill Shorten is authentic. Can I change the question to anybody? <laughs> is anybody? <authentic? laughs> Brilliant. What was that? Wasn't, that, was that wasn't a resounding vote. That's all no, I that was that was about fifteen percent of the crowd. So then the follow-up question, why don't people believe Bill Shorten? So uh, we touched on it before, and authenticity is everything. Um, and that's what allows politicians to cut through. Um, 
the authenticity to put forward an idea, the authenticity to believe in concepts in Bill Shorten's um, area to take a nation forward. I don't think people fully believe in those concepts that he's backing. I neither think nor they do in Scott Morrison or anybody else, but there is a lack of authenticity in what he's saying. I don't think there's a lack of conviction. Uh, I think he's convicted to get elected, but I don't think he necessarily believes what he's saying himself. Gosh, well, that was a bunch of yeah. words that Bill Shorten would not like to hear. Christine, does it come back to, at one stage, Bill Shorten was convinced that Kevin Rudd should be the Prime Minister, then he was convinced Julia Gillard should be the Prime Minister, then I think he was convinced again that Kevin Rudd should be the Prime Minister. I can't remember, because there were some very awkward, flip-flopping yeah. press conferences. Does I it think, go back to that time? I, I, I think... Probably. I think there was a lot of... The faceless men who rapidly became very... Well, their faces became very familiar. I think Australians had them picked pretty quickly and didn't forget that. Um, yeah, I think particularly probably for Shorten, if you... I, Shorten first leapt onto the public um, radar with the Beaconsfield Mind of Disaster when he was a union leader. And he flew down there and spent... Well, he was there every day um, outside of the, the mine. And, and that actually was considered very authentic. You know, he, was a, he was a union leader doing, you know, being there for his blokes. And the press conferences he gave at that time had a ring of, of, of authenticity about them. Things, when, when he left that and became a player in the leadership crises, people did a double take. I think more than anything. And I, I, I can't put my finger on anything else, to be honest. But probably that moment where he said, I think there was the point during the probably 2013 election, no, sorry, 2010, when um, his, the, Julia Gillard had announced something and he was asked during oh, an inter yeah. TV interview, what do you think of Julia Gillard? He hadn't heard the announcement. He said, I don't know, but I agree with whatever she said. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and that he said that with such conviction yeah. as well. <laughs> he was like, you know, I really believe what she said. It is interesting because you look at the at polls, he can't gain ground as preferred prime minister, really. Maybe he got a little bit in the most recent one, but barely. What, what, what's... what's I'll, I'll Guide Bill Shorten. Patrick, what's going on? Why Bill Shorten? I th no, I said guide Bill Shorten. Uh, the, if, if he is, the, the, is in the pole interest, position. The, the interesting question is, any, is, can anyone be described as actually authentic? Because inevitably, a political leader is talking to different groups at different times and appealing to different characteristics of each of those groups. And if you then put all the bits together, and you, you know, you must eventually find that you slightly I, contradict yourself. Yeah. You can't help I it. Think, I think politics doesn't mean you can't be authentic, have conviction, and be comfortable in your own skin. And I don't think any of those three things apply to Bill Shorten. Oh, I would have thought he's very comfortable in his own skin. Um, mainly because he has one advantage that Julia Gillard and Kevin Rudd didn't have, which is he doesn't have Kevin, Bill Shorten behind him. But you, you, don't, you don't think he's not worried about... I mean, this is my, this is my hugely depressing uh, outlook on Australian politics. If the Labor Party wins the next election, I genuinely believe that this leadership crisis just continues to roll on, genuinely, and, and I will tell you why. On our side of politics, you have, you know, Howard talks about the broad church, conservatives and liberals, and that has played out. On the Labor side, it is just as bad between inner city left and working class. Don't for a second underestimate this huge division running through the Labor Party today. And the moment they get into government, governing is hard, the spotlight comes back on them, these divisions will play out every single day they're making decisions because they'll have to make those decisions on policy. And you have people like Anthony Albanese, who I rate really highly, I think is a great, you know, would make a very good Labor leader. Um, do you think he's just gonna say, this is all all right, I'm gonna let the Labor Party go down this path? And unfortunately, my prediction uh, is that this will play out uh, over the coming years. I don't see us breaking out of this cycle because Bill Shorten becomes Prime Minister. But that's the test, isn't it? Do we get a Prime Minister who provides some sort of leadership? And we don't know until they get the job. Yeah, of course. I mean, we, you can never actually tell how good somebody's going to be till they're in that job because there is no training for that job. No. 
So the question then will be whether the Labour Party ministers, if they win, value coherence against individual policy. That's going to be the test. We, I don't know and, the and, I don't know the answer. None of us know. Well, the, the, num the numbers already say that um, if it was Albanese and Plibersek as a one-two ticket, it's a slam dunk. And the greatest problem already is but, if they change, which they won't. I mean, we, we already know which, that Bill which Shorten doesn't value. Is that? But, but I mean, we already know the Labour Party don't value consistency at the moment. I mean, just just look in the last week, just in the last week or last couple of weeks. You had the Labor Party saying that the national energy guarantee was a Frankenstein, was the worst policy, we can't let it through the parliament, it's terrible, you know, which would have been the one circuit breaker, I think, to start the path down dealing with climate policy. This week, we need the NEG, it's the best policy, it's great. I mean, just in the last few weeks, I don't see how, if that's where Bill goes on such a significant issue, not just on Rudd or Gillard, but actually dealing with the fundamental policies facing the country, why anyone thinks they're going to be a great consistent government that's going to not fall down into this uh, divide in the Labor Party. Because opposition is no test of government. No, that's right. And I think, you know, to go but, to the point, yeah. I mean, we forget that everybody governs with certain times. Who knew that the um, GFC was going to happen? Who knew that Port Arthur was going to happen? I mean, there are things, and we live in an increasingly, you know, fast-paced, unpredictable world. Um, you know, I don't know if Howard would have won in 2001 if we hadn't had Tam well, Tampa, was a, was a great example, or 9-11, or, um, you know. So it's very hard to predict. The other thing is, you, yeah, you don't know, yes, you might be, you're always going to have the left, the right, the factions, all that sort of thing, but so did Howard, as you've said, so did Hawke. Some people are much better at managing allegiances. It's one of the reasons why I think that um, everybody would be better served if our politicians spent more time doing something else, you know, working with human beings and working out. I mean, I think about this all the time with my, my children. You know, when you are parenting, you have to settle disputes all the time where you can't say, well, you're great and you're awful. You know, you know, you suck forever and you're fantastic. You have to find compromise. And I think that, and similarly when you're around a board table or when you're working with a team at work, you know, you have to find ways to make things, you know, function. Um, I'd, I'd jump in, I think in, in that regard, there's a lot that we can do. Um, the fact that you, got, you guys have turned up tonight is a really, really healthy um, indication that things can change because, there's a lot, because democracy happens when people turn up and when they get involved. Um, my suggestion would be sometimes we need to stop thinking, what can they do? Why can't they change? And start thinking what we can do. And showing up is, is, a, is a first step. Another thing I would encourage is um, we're increasingly encouraged to think of the world as black and white. You know, your bad must be killed with fire, your good, and you'll never do any wrong. And Trump obviously is what David Brooks of the New York Times calls the exclamation point or the exclamation mark on that trend. I'd encourage you, the first, next time you think, oh, well, you know, you're an asshole, excuse the language, but because I disagree with you, stop and think, well, democracy started in Athens because uh, society had gotten too big for everybody to have the same opinion. You know, once they, people moved out of villages where everyone was a shepherd and agreed or whatever, they realised they had to have a way to manage people disagreeing. So people disagreeing, having different points of view, thinking that things should be run differently, that is a sign of a healthy system, not of a dysfunctional system. It becomes dysfunctional when we refuse to allow that disagreement. And when we decide that we're going to drive... So we. <laughs> Let them talk. Let them talk. Okay, so we. The reason we're here tonight is to address questions that people have asked. So, Christine, carry on. On, on our. Oh, I'm sorry if you're frustrated. I, I can stop right now. Not at all. I'd like you to continue. Um, I will. Yeah. To, th I think this is a really important point, though, sir, because Trump is setting the agenda whereby you can only be on one side or the other. 
problems facing Indigenous Australia, great example. We're never going to win, it, win that if um, you know, one side decides all bad or all good. We have to get together to work on that stuff. And we as voters have to say, that's what we want. We want to reward consensus building and working together rather than sitting on the, allowing them to continue doing this thing where it's just about commentary on Sky saying they're all bad, we're all good, and never the twain shall meet. Brilliantly put, Christine. And on our capacity to disagree effectively, it's one of the great uh, philosophical conundrums of this time, a point very well made. To the question. I'm my next. Okay, thank you. Look, I, I don't object to you people talking on about the issues. I think it's a good idea because we do get some answers and some ideas about what's happening. My question is this. Having listened to all that you've said, the word that occurs to me about democracy in the Western democratic system worldwide is disillusionment. And that is expressed very strongly with many surveys that indicate about 50%, I'll repeat that data, 50% of millenniums are totally disillusioned with the democratic system and would in fact prefer to see people like Erdogan and uh, um, Putin and Trump, etc., in office rather than going down the path which we've just talked about, expressing our democratic democratic right to have a view, etc., etc. Most people feel that, or many millenniums feel that as a failure. The question is, is there hope around the millenniums who are the future in the democratic system? Sorry, where's your source for that? Okay. Because I've never heard that. Oh, okay. Everyone go. Okay, so... <laughs> Hang on a second, I think Christine has the information. I actually knew this question would come up, so... That's the Lowy poll. No, you're, you're actually... Uh, the Erdogan-Putin thing, they haven't been endorsed by the millennials. But um, the, the Lowy Institute's actually been polling the question of democracy since 2012. Um, in 2012, only 39% of young Australians aged 18 to 29 expressed a preference for democracy. Only 39%. This year, it's the response of a broader group aged 18 to 44 years, which differs from older Australian. Only 47% of that group aged 18 to 44 in 2018 say democracy is preferable, compared with 76% of those aged 45 and older. I'd say, and then I'll shut up, um, <laughs> I, I, I heard those numbers, sir, and thought, that's appalling. What the hell's happening? A couple of things to, meet her out, meet, to, to mitigate, I think, some of us, sort of gesture to us being the old ones, um, can remember, you know, or remember our history and remember that bad things happen when you don't have democracy. You know what the alternatives are. And to borrow from Woody Allen, you know, about saying, he said, I think it was what, um, life is hard, but it's better than the alternative. Democracy's hard, but it's <laughs> better than most of the alternatives. I think a lot of these people who are saying that, they have no idea what the alternatives are. And I also think it's a reflection less about, hey, I want Putin's Russia, and more about, I really don't like what democracy is throwing up at the moment. Just affection. What? Are you a millennial? Yeah. Gem Y, is that like close to a millennial? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in 1990. What does that make me? Young. No, you're yeah. Gen Y. Gen Y. Yeah. yeah. We Just... never want to put you in a pigeonhole. Yeah. Please it, don't. To the gentleman's question, is there hope for the next generation, the youngest generation of voters? Yeah, I mean, I, you, you have to have, I think, anyone that's involved in politics, brutal optimism about how good it can be, not how bad it is. Everyone knows how bad politics is, but it should be a force for change for the better. So, um, yes, I am optimistic, and I gave one example in Macron before, you know, not the Messiah, but I think on the right path. Um, the one thing I would say about what is driving this disillusionment, I think completely agree with absolutely everything you said. Uh, the difference today to say 10 or 20 years ago, because if you, if you polled you know, Australians during the Vietnam War and you said, do you like Australian politics at the moment? I don't think they would have all run out and said, geez, it's really great. Um, but what is different today to then is again, I go back to this point, the way that we communicate with each other and who we listen to. So if you think about you know, difficult times in our past, people would watch the news, they'd listen to the radio and they'd read two or three newspapers. And that provided a filter and at its best 
removing bias in that conversation. Today, we consume all our media from sources that we agree with. There's a really good example of this. Who reads a newspaper every, every day, online or otherwise? Just put your hands up. Okay. Who reads a newspaper oh, that reports a view that they disagree with? So if you're left, do you read the Australian and the Korea Mail? And if you're right, do you read uh, you know, the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age? So you can see that number dropped quite significantly. Uh, and that is, I think, the real danger that's driving this. If I always listen to people who agree with me, have my same bias, my same opinion, same anger, same hate at the world, that becomes a cycle and we sit in that echo chamber and that didn't exist 20, 30, 40 years ago. So how society breaks out of that, I think, is a, is a really fundamental and difficult question. But it, it's, there's an important point that people have made and, and why you're probably the best person to answer this. Um, we should demand of our politicians that they are not career politicians. We yeah. should demand of our politicians that they have real work experience. And the point um, Christine was making about interacting with the issues and whatever stage, and, and I think what you'd probably agree, you are a very different person to where you were back when you were in yeah. Parliament. And, and we should demand of that, and we should expect that. And that's the only one thing I should say about democracy. And if we go all the way back to history, we, we need some wisdom. We need that eclectic mix in Parliament. But I, I really worry about this career. They were a staffer, they were a volunteer. Now, I think that is what's, because that's the echo chamber that is so, so dangerous. It's the echo chamber and it does one thing that's even worse, is they exist to be elected. And yeah, the exactly. moment you exist to be elected, you do everything in your power to get re-elected and not to make that change. And you know, my initial point where I said, I'd rather try and do reform and lose, that's always been the way that I've approached this, as opposed to do anything and everything in your power to get yourself re-elected and principles, philosophy, vision, just doesn't matter. No other job you can get, uh, unless it's your entry job, without work experience. Your CV has to say, what relevant experience have you got? And whilst there is no training to govern, whilst there is, there is nothing there, we should demand in democracy, in a complex one, we should demand of people that they have relevant experience. Yeah, well, I, I would, sort of, I, I would add a little bit more to that. Parliament is better when it is representative of the Australian people. And, in, and to your point before about, this is true for every organisation, a, a board of a publicly listed company, a community organisation, anything. It is better when it is representative and it has diversity. So I don't think, you know, you need to be a great lawyer or a great union representative to be a great politician. But for whatever reason, we get a lot of that. And I think you often see people who are great CEOs, great lawyers, great union reps who become terrible politicians. So I'm not 100% convinced it's the CV, but you are right, it is the diversity in background. It's experiencing different things in life. It's coming from a different community, it, talking to different people. But what's become more and more in the public eye is pre-selection. So the pre-selection yeah. process is still a backroom process. The, we don't get the best candidate that we think for the air. We get the candidate that has been pre-selected. Yeah, I, I, this is like a massively partisan point on this, but I can speak to experience. I mean, I, I mean I'm sure there's other people in the room that have been through pre-selections, but let's be honest about this. I was a 19-year-old, you know, economically conservative, socially progressive candidate who won a pre-selection in a winnable seat uh, that used to be the home of one nation. So the idea that all these backroom deals matter is not necessarily true. You have hit an absolutely critical point that will change Australian democracy for the better is if you reform these pre-selection processes. It is, I don't want to be partisan about this, it's just the truth. Uh, in, in Queensland, in the LNP, if you're, a local, if you're a local member and you live in that community, you vote in the pre-selection. In the Labor Party, it matters what faction, what union, and head office decides. And I actually do believe if you say to a community, you elect the person that will stand for your side of politics for the parliament, they're usually going to elect someone who would be well placed to represent them. So I actually do think that's a, a really good system. And the, just the truth is, it's not the same in both sides of politics in Australia. All right, let's go to, I reckon we've got time for maybe three quick questions to wrap it up. Yes, sir. 
We, we talked about authenticity of, of leaders and, uh, and the next leader that comes along. I don't really think it's about just the next leader that comes along. It, it's, the leaders are, it, it's, it's always the solution. We just need this great person that will come along and be truly authentic and, and, and solve all of our problems. The system itself is the problem. Democracy, you said it before, needs to be disrupted. And so um, around the world, um, you know, as Wyatt was uh, mentioning, interesting stuff in Spain, five-star movement in Italy, they pre-select their members on, you know, uh, electronically. Um, direct democracy, um, Switzerland has 80% trust in government as opposed to 20% here. So we're not bereft of ideas and innovations around the world as to how to actually improve our democracy. Can the panel um, enlighten us on, on what they think are the most fruitful? Or promising. Yeah. Well, am I going to Patrick on this one? Yeah, I, I'm actually involved in a research study at the moment looking at the way cabinets work in Australia and Britain with the Westminster system, Denmark and the Netherlands, which have proportional representation, and Switzerland, which has a fascinating cabinet made up of members of four different parties um, who manage to work together, and they seem to do quite a good job in Switzerland. So part of it is there are alternative systems which actually can make people talk more, which don't divide people on opposition and government, so that you know what the government does is wrong and what we're going to do is better, which require a considerable negotiations before you decide what it is that you're going to do. And therefore, actually, there are other ways of coming up with systems which bring consensus and agreement. And of course, in the Swiss case, every piece of legislation that you pass has the potential of being the subject of a referendum. So Swiss is different, but they, they cover a lot of the problems that we have and do it very differently and govern the country pretty well. It's a fairly prosperous country, although it's got its own, it's, it's got its own problems at the, at the moment, but they're not nearly as great. So yes, we could look at other ways of doing it. We should not actually just say about our political system that it's the best there is. People talk about the genius of our constitution. It was sort of an inherited version of the British government at the time, which was then a monarchy. Um, and a monarchy with a still comparatively small electoral base, which is, male suffrage, certainly not female suffrage, um, and therefore quite limited in the way that it actually operated. There are other ways of doing things which we probably need to look at and say, is this a better way than we got there? How we get there if we do it, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, because constitutional change is so difficult. Yes. But there are better ways of getting a consensus and getting agreement. We need a vision. Uh, you know, is Australia just gonna be a big mine with nice beaches around the edge? And we need a vision. <laughs> It, it, we need a vision. You'll be reassured to know that Kevin Rudd used that quote yeah, know, during his election campaign. We need a vision that we, the community, agree on. So what binds many of these nations together is they have a clear vision. Uh, interestingly, one of the things in the state of Queensland is, did everybody know that the Queensland plan is still a thing? It came into Campbell Newman. It's still there, it still exists. Where, whether you agree or disagree about it, it was a vision for where people want Queensland. And what we need is the bravery on both sides of politics to have a vision of where Australia is going and stick to it. Have your policies, you can change, you can tweak at the edges, but the things about caring for the most vulnerable of people, the things about growing our economy, we should have and we should, we should hold up. And that goes beyond constitution and the other things. But that's, that, that's the, the problem, though, Neil, isn't it? We can't agree on the vision. We can't agree on how to grow the economy. It but, sounds but I, great in I, theory, but if people don't agree on whether we should have a, a, a coal mine run by Adani or not, then you, you can't agree on the vision. But I don't think we should get down into That's the detail of political part, but we should have a vision of where Australia is going. Um, uh, every other country seems to have a very strong vision, and I, I like, you know, like the UK really... at the moment. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. not the UK. Or... No, 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 no. I mean, but the question yeah. was actually not really what the vision is. It's how do you reform democracy to make it better, right? Yeah. So, um, it, it's a great conversation to have. When we have this conversation, there's a lot of things that practically will probably not happen in the foreseeable future because the mechanisms to change it is really hard. There are a few things I think we can do that would have a positive impact on democracy relatively easily. The biggest thing I think is fixed terms. So I've thought about this a lot. But if you sit in a democratic process where an election can be called at any time, 
It's a three-year cycle in Australia. I think, what is the average election cycle now? It's, looking at the professor, it's like two years, two, two years maybe a bit less. You, you can't do any of this stuff in two years. And that uncertainty creates all sorts of unintended consequences. So in the next election, a political party leader could run out and say, I would support you know, four-year, five-year, whatever, fixed terms in the next parliament if the other side of politics agrees. And I think in an election campaign, you could actually do that in Australia, and that would have a positive impact. The voting system, I think, really does skew politics in weird ways in Australia. Uh, with compulsory preferential voting, which is relatively unique in Australia, you know, in, in my first parliament, um, Ricky Muir, who's a great guy, got like 1,200 votes. Uh, Helen, who's a friend of mine, got 400 and something thousand, and she lost to him. That creates weird consequences in the Senate uh, and these things. So I think a compulsory preferential voting system is, is not democratic and has these unintended consequences. Optional preferential, great. If you want to give preferences, do. So there are things like this mm. that would improve Australian politics and the discussion we have. And I think you find some common ground there with the ABC's Anthony Green on that. Yep. Second last question for the night. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Have you got a microphone? Oh, it's over this side. Um, hi, so I'm, uh, I'm 28 years old. I'm embarrassingly uh, admitting that when I was younger, there was a lot of pressure. I grew up in a house where my dad was constantly saying, this politician's beat, this politician's beat, you know, all that. It was constant lies and stuff like that. So I grew up to kind of understand, well, who am I going to believe? Who am I going to understand? Got to high school, we started like critically analysing newspapers and stuff like that. That was really fantastic for me. But still didn't have a lot of faith in the system, didn't have a lot of faith in Australian politics. Um, until, like, I didn't really have faith in politics until, ironically, I moved to London two years ago. Um, and I was surrounded by people who, who understood and had faith and there was things going on and there was discussions and open discussions and including the news and media and stuff like that where not everyone uh, agreed continually. Um, I'm just wondering, like, I'm really trying to understand, that's why I've come here tonight, I'm really trying to understand Australian politics again because I have kind of blanked it out of my mind for so long because it was, like, you know, with my generation, we grew up with the social media and the technology revolution that bombarded us, which I think that's why a lot of, I don't know, from personal experience around my friends and stuff, that's so why when, they feel overwhelmed. When you say you're trying to understand, you mean the processes or... The, the, um. <laughs> what, what, what's confusing you? I don't know. I, I might be alone here, but I just... I, I get confused as to why... Like, how our governments can be just kicked out and when the people have voted for that person or how, like, really racist views kind of, like, get embedded into our laws and stuff like that. Um, like, I don't know. I'm not really sure. I think the, hmm. yeah, I think I think there's been a lot of confusion just in general. And am I making sense to anyone? Well, well, I, yeah, I, I, I guess I kind of want to know from your point of view. Yeah. <laughs> is, is that kind of it? Why is it so messy at the moment? Is that kind of well that? But also, I want to know from you, uh, each of you, your point of views. Like, where can we? Where can we get the real, I guess, shit? Where can we get the real information? <laughs> like, yeah. where? I, I think Rebecca's drive program on ABC in the morning is really, <laughs> really good. Uh, Maybe. But yeah, I, but used to, <laughs> I used to have a regular spot with Beck every week and it just died. I brought you in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah but, but, you know, even that, in saying that, partly the appetite from the public to hear from politicians is limited. Yeah. I got criticised yeah. a lot because I gave Wyatt Roy and Glenn Lazarus at the time yeah. and Larissa Waters and um, Graham Parrott. Yeah. We rolled through the four and each time I would get hammered with why are you so sympathetic to their views, why are you letting them get on and just spruik... And I was going, you need to hear from the people you've elected. Yeah. You, Don't you, you want to hear I, this? I think there's that, and I, back to my earlier point, listen to people who disagree with you, and I think that's really, really important. To your broader point about sort of what's happening in Australia, why is it messy, I'm going to do my best to try and answer that. Um, politicians are good at just answering questions they want to answer anyway, rather than, you know, what was put to them. So uh, I can just talk, I've got a mic. You can't. Uh, no one's going to have a problem with it. Um, this, this, is the, uh, this, is the, um, this is the interesting thing about Australian politics at the moment. Our country is actually doing incredibly well. 
if you stop and look at this, it's the front page of The Economist um, recently. Uh, we've had 27 years of uninterrupted economic growth. No country on the planet has had more than a quarter of a century of uninterrupted economic growth. Uh, living standards continue to rise very strongly. Wages are rising, uh, huge economic growth. That's a really good story. But this is across 27 years. This is across, you know, Hawke, Keating, Howard, and a whole bunch at the end. Um, <laughs> that is a remarkable story. And underneath all of that, we have so much noise and, you know, um, everything that goes with politics today. If you put our record as a country over the last 25, 27 years against any of these others, um, I think we would actually be kind of proud of it as Australians. But it's such an Australian thing to talk ourselves down, to have tall poppies, to have this yelling, and I think that some of this gets lost uh, to that bigger picture. So, you know, my advice, you know, if you want to take it or not, is, you know, probably look at the underlying good things but, about our country it, as well. But I think your point is incredibly valid, which is you just don't know. And I think it's, I, I, I agree with all the statements you have, all the World Economic Forum reports all there, but that's it, where do you go? And one of the things, and it goes to the last question as well, I think one of the travesties, and, uh, and I'm not best qualified in the history, is Canberra. It is a group think bubble. Yeah. Um, if there was more actual business and real activity in and around where this heart of politics is, as there is in London, it might be a, a more engaged place. But I think that the real question is to take away is, how do you get engaged? Because it's actually not your job to find that out. It's not, and that's what I think is wrong. You feel a moral sense of obligation to engage in democracy, great. But actually, it's the very fact that you're not being connected with whatever your political views. And I actually think that's the issue. I actually think that's the real point. So, because you can pick up any media you want to, but I don't think you're being connected with. And, and that's what worries me, and politics needs to be disrupted. I'd say, firstly, just being here, Honestly, turning up tonight is exactly the sort of thing that you should do and keep doing. I think that democracy itself doesn't need to be pitched out in favour of you know, some other system, um, but it can be changed. In fact, a great man once said, because that's democracy, contested, cranky, incoherent. He can't prop... Can you remember writing that? <laughs> um, you made him blush. It will change. <laughs> it will change because of people like you. You don't have to join a political party. You can get involved. And I've seen more and more of this. I think, again, probably made easier because of things like social media. The things that are a nightmare can also be a blessing. I, you know, I think there's a bunch of people around me campaigning against the zip line that's going on Mount Cotha. Yeah. And... It, that's a great example. People weren't waiting for a political party to do one thing or the other, although the Greens have gotten involved, obviously. They've formed their own community group. They've read the, the documentation. It's all available. And they're creating their own groups. Pick an issue that you care about. It might be something about domestic violence. It might be about child protection. It might be about an environmental issue. It might be about an Indigenous issue. And get involved and connect with those people that also care about it and work your way through the system. I really do think that the future of the system will come from outside of it. Um, we've seen things like change.org. We've seen things like the stuff that you're talking about. There are so many ways that digital is actually being used to, to, to change things for the good or at least empower people like you. It, and it, uh, we've got to wrap it up, but I would say um, certainly you heard, would have heard voices discussing the zip line at Mount Cutha on ABC Radio Brisbane. Local radio, we are constantly saying, what do you think? What do you want to know? Here is the Lord Mayor. Here is your local mayor. Here is your Premier, your Treasurer. What do you think of what they are saying? Give them feedback. When the Prime Minister's in town, we put them on the radio so that we can directly connect you to them. And... Um, even though on social media you can sort of do that, whether or not you'll get a response, I don't know, but on local radio. So I uh, look forward to taking your can, talk can, back, Paul. Can, <laughs> can I just add, add one thing? The comment, democracy is the very worst form of government, except for all the others that have been tried from time to time. <laughs> that's not me, that's Churchill. It is Churchill. Uh, well, uh, but it, it's important to get the first bit there, that people want often easy answers and there aren't any. 
People want everyone to agree, and they don't, and they shouldn't. Politics is about people with different interests getting together and finding some sort of common ground or finding some way of solving the problem because it's better than fighting. I mean, the great argument that I would have against Brexit and the great argument in favour of the European community, this is the longest period of peace that Western Europe has ever had. It matters when people talk to each other and people are integrated. It wasn't planned that way. It happened that way because people turned up and tried to actually make an effort. So to the comment I would always say, and you're here, it's the people who participate, the people who turn up, the people who try and find out the solutions, the people who sort of sit there and ring up Wyatt, the 300 people who said... Not anymore. It, well, I know, he's the, his successor. The, the people who, who are sort of pushing all the time, they're the people who can make democracy work. And the notion you sit back and want a dictator is fine for about a day until that dictator doesn't do what you want and does what she wants. Mm. Ladies and gents, we've got to wrap it up. Um, one very quick question to each of you to finish, and all I need is a, a two-word answer. Come uh, the next federal election in May 2019, who will be the Prime Minister of Australia? Wyatt? At the election or after the election? After the election. <laughs> <laughs> just Everyone need knows a name. my view. Just Scott. We'll just say Scott. Well, they're going to go ask them. You have to actually answer the question. No, I don't. I've been listening to you all evening. <laughs> He's opting out. Christine? I just, I really want to say, democracy will be the winner on the day. Uh, but, uh, but um, having watched trends, I can't, I, I can't see this government um, being re-elected. I just, I, I, I can't see it, but... Sounds like you can't bring yourself to say Bill Shorten either. No, well, <laughs> unpopular leader, but a very big two-party preferred trend. Morrison may have something smart as a former treasurer. He may call a budget early, which would make sense, then have the election in May. But I just can't see them turning it around. They've shown no ability. Neil? There's, there's two questions, and I'm sorry to be elongated about this, is who will run the best campaign and who's best to govern? So in terms of who will run the best campaign, Bill Shorten. Uh, and Bill Shorten will run the best campaign um, and they will engage better. Who's best to govern? Well, that's up to democracy. Um, but it's about the best campaign. It's not about who will be prime minister. I'll, I'll actually answer no the question and say, I honestly don't know. But at this stage, it's actually an open, open field. The polls are close enough that either side can win depending on the next six months. Okay. Ladies and gents, um, let's all agree that the headline from tonight will be politics in the pub, so good, woman faints. <laughs> Please thank our panellists tonight, Neil, Christine, Patrick and Wyatt Roy. And thank you so much for being here. Thanks for showing up.